Hello, thank you. Um, hopefully I will be entertaining enough to, to keep you awake. I know how, it's always hard going after lunch because you eat lunch and then you feel drowsy and this room is very, very warm. I don't know if any of you have been in this room earlier today, but it is quite warm. So I will start just by introducing myself. My name is Christine Fruin. Um, I am the Scholarly Communication and Digital Projects Manager at ATLA. Some of you may be, well, what is ATLA? So ATLA is the name of a nonprofit uh, organization that I work for um, that is, our tagline is, we are collectors and connectors in religion and theology. So it is a organization that kind of has two sides. We have a side of our organization that um, builds a variety of database products. Um, so subscription database products that are offered through EBSCO that libraries and archives and, and other organizations, um, universities and such subscribe to, uh, so research, research databases. Then we have a member program side, which is um, a true like library association that about, um, about 700 members, both libraries and individual librarians, whose focus is the teaching and learning of religion and theology. And that term is as broad as possible. Um, our roots are in Christianity, but we have much, much broader reach in areas of religion and theology, definitely more world religion. Um, we used to be known as the American Theological Library Association, but we changed our name almost a year ago to just ATLA because our reach has become such much so much more global. Um, we have a lot of representation in Africa and in other parts of Europe now, um, in Canada. And so we're, we went through a rebranding and changed our name and our logo to reflect kind of the changing nature of our organization. So I work on the member program side, which is the member, um, the member side of the association. And one of the many member services that we offer is our open access press, which is known as Atla Open Press. As part of that, which I'm going to talk about later, we publish open books, open monographs, and that's what I'm here to talk about today. So if that's not what you came to hear about, you have five seconds to go find the room you're supposed to be in. Or if you're like, oh, that's not what I want. Uh, she's boring. Please, you will not offend me if you, if you want to move on. So ATLA Open Press, I've been at ATLA for about two years, a little over two years, um, and have really been working to kind of organize and professionalize the press. Um, prior to that, I was a scholarly communications librarian at both the University of Florida and the University of Illinois in the United States. Um, so our scope statement for the ATLA Open Press is that we publish and host um, open access books and journals that lie at the intersection of librarianship and the study of theology and religion, including works that impact the work of theological librarians that guide and support innovative library services and enhance professional development. So um, we not only publish books and journals um, ourselves as an association, but we also host third party content as well. So like I said, we have 700 members of both you know, libraries and individuals as well as a variety of affiliates. So we have recently launched um, journal hosting um, on their behalf as well. So this is a little bit, I know it's very, very text heavy, I'm sorry. Um, a little bit about our structure and our program. So our financial structure is kind of interesting as far as an open access press goes. As I mentioned earlier, when I was talking about the organization of our association, we have the products side of the house, all of our databases, the EBSCO products. So the revenue that we derive from that, it's not funding, um, staff salaries and, 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 and extravagant things. We are taking that revenue and reinvesting it in programs that support our members. One of those programs being our, being our press. So the money that we use to run the press is derived from the profits that we're realizing off of the databases that our members, um, or that not just our members, but others subscribe to. Um, for, our, for our journals, we do not charge any APCs. That's not, like I said, we run the journals based on the revenues that we're realizing from the other side of the association. All of our open access journals are licensed under a CC BY NC license. For our monographs, for our open books, again, we do not charge any author fees. However, we do pay authors a modest, a modest honorarium. We pay our author, if it's a single author monograph, we pay those authors a $1,000 US honorarium for authoring a book and publishing with us. Um, we just published a, um, an edited volume, uh, and so we paid out an honorarium to the guest editor, as well as an honorarium to each of the individual chapters, kind of at a prorated basis. Um, I think total we paid for the book for about $2,000 US in honorariums out to the guest editor and the individual chapter author. So um, 
Our open monographs are available both as EPUB and PDF as well as print on demand for a very nominal fee. Right now we're using KDP, which is an Amazon um, product to do our print on demand, but we're currently exploring some other print on demand options. Um, as I said, we also do journal hosting. So we currently have a couple different associations, um, organizations that host journals with us. The Wabash Center for Ter Teaching and Learning, um, they actually terminated their relationship with Wiley. Um, they had been publishing a subscription-based journal for 20 years. They're like, we want, to, we want to bring this journal open access, but unfortunately the relationship they had with Wiley did not let them bring that journal over. They didn't realize they had signed full intellectual property over to them. So they started a whole brand new journal that just published today. Their very first issue went out today. So we were, it was a pretty exciting day that we helped them completely start this whole new journal that we are hosting for them on our installation of OJS. Um, also the Australia New Zealand Theological Library Association, we have hosted their journal for a number of years also in OJS. Um, so we charge very nominal um, setup fee and a very, very nominal hosting fee um, for our, whether you're a member or a non-member. Um, and basically with, for that fee, we're providing the technical infrastructure as well as some consulting time with me to talk about copyright and author agreements and just good ethical publishing. Um, so if you want to learn more about that, you're free to, to just, if you just want, you know, I have an MOU, I'm, I'm willing to share just as an example, you can, you can reach out to me about that. Um, so like I said, we do books, journals, and other serials, and then um, these, these publishing services. As far as our governance, um, all of our publications do have editors or, or editorial boards, and these are made up of, our mem of the members of our association, serve as editors-in-chief and members of the editorial board, and we actually pay them um, a um, quarterly stipend for serving on the editorial boards. Um, we feel that their time is valuable, the service they're giving, serving in the role of editor um, is, is a valuable service, so we do pay them quarterly stipends for doing that. In addition, we have an advisory council, which is made up of our four editors-in-chief of our, of our primary publications, as well as two at-large members, which we just filled those positions. One, a internal, a, a member, um, at-large member, as well as an external. Um, and Nikki Agate from Columbia University is our new at-large external member, so we're pretty excited about that. As far as internal staffing, the press is directed by me as scholarly communication digital projects manager. I also have a scholarly communication coordinator um, who I just hired two months ago, who manages all of kind of like the layout and design, does training of our editorial boards on how to use OJS and OMP, as well as our other um, open source platform that we use with Books Editoria, which I'm gonna be talking about shortly. Um, and then our information systems that does our IT work for our entire association. They're the ones that maintain the software, OJS, OMP, on our um, servers. And in fact, just last month on the PKP blog, they um, interviewed our director of IS about how we are hosting OJS and OMP on AWS servers. So if, you, if that's something that's, apparently that was of great interest to PKP. They're like, really, you're hosting this on AWS? Tell us more. And they wrote, a, and, and PKP uh, wrote up a blog about that. So you can learn more about technically how we're hosting this um, on that. Editoria, which is the other um, open source software that we use to do our books, um, we actually um, host that right now through, um, through a third party service that COCO um, Foundation manages. So books at Atla Open Press, boy this is hard to see. Um, so Books at Atla Open Press launched in 2014. So our primary, open, uh, our primary open access journal, Theological Librarianship, has been published on OJS. We uh, just finished up our 12th year of publishing, and it's been on OJS from the, from the beginning. In 2014, one of our members had written a book, and she's like, I really want to publish this open access, but all the open access book publishers out there are charging authors several thousand dollars to make their available, book available open access. Is there anything that you can do to support us? And so because we had had such great success with OJS, I, this was before I came, um, we're like, well, they some, you know, discovered that, oh, PKP has a complementary software, OMP, and so we installed that and used that to host her book. So um, we had a couple other member-authored works as well as some digital reprints of some books that Atla owns the copyright to. And at that point in time, we were only using OMP as just purely a storefront, a place to just kind of host the files. We didn't really have a formal editorial board. It was just really use it as a place to operate as a storefront, a place to put the files, a place where people could access those files. 
Um, and then when I came on in 2017, I'm like, whoa, we are not realizing the full potential of the back end of OMP the way we are with OJS. There's all these things that we could be doing with it. And also at that time, we were finally onboarding an editorial board, an editor in chief, and two editors to kind of manage um, the, you know, soliciting content and reviewing content and, and all that for, for the press. I mean, the books was just really kind of getting going. So I began really kind of digging into using the back end of OMP to manage our open book press. Um, and start and realize that there wasn't a lot of documentation out there now, but I know that we're working on that because my staff member has been working and contributing to that. Um, but also, we just you know really start looking at okay, what is our workflow? Um, what is our you know? And because the way we developed our workflow right now is we have a proposal process. We don't just accept full manuscripts unsolicited. Authors have to submit to us a proposal of of what book they want to author. So they have to have you know, an abstract, a proposed list of chapters, um, perhaps an, an early working bibliography, a current CV, and that is what the editorial board reviews first to see if this is something that is, first of all, falls within the press's scope, and if it is something that they actually want to proceed with, in, you know, t with publishing, although we never make a promise to publish, then the author receives an invitation then to submit a full manuscript. Um, so those proposals and the actual peer review of those proposals or the editorial board review of those proposals is done through OMP. Um, we we kind of use the, the submission process to do that, use the peer review. There, so just like in OJS, you can set up peer review forms and things. We're doing that all through OMP. Um, additionally, during kind of this 2017 to 2018 time, we didn't really have a good solid author agreement and myself being a copyright lawyer, Having a good author agreement was very critical for me, so I looked at the model digital scholarship agreement that came out of a um, grant-funded project between the University of Michigan and Emory and, and kind of adopted that for our open book press. Um, and also just kind of drafted more robust author instructions and guidelines. So as we worked through OMP, discovered that there were there's lots of things about it that we liked. We liked the submission process. We liked the way to manage peer review. We liked the way to manage communication between authors and editors instead of people using personal email. But some of the downfalls, you know, the, that we were kind of facing were first of all the reliance upon Word documents and track changes, and the, and the uploading and the ver and different versioning. Same things that probably are encountered in OJS as well is kind of managing you know what version you're on and the track changes in Word and what happens when you open up Word documents on other computers if someone's not running the same version of Word it was introducing all kinds it was introducing errors for us um, and also just kind of so just that kind of peer review process the other thing that we were experiencing in, internally was when we would do a book we were paying outside designers to lay out and, and, and design our books in InDesign. We were actually paying people externally because we didn't have in-house experience to actually produce a finished looking professional book in a template that reflected our brand and was something that was going to be of printable or you know, in viewable quality online. Um, and so when I attended the Library Publishing Coalition's annual forum, I don't know if you all are familiar with the Library Publishing Coalition. If not, I encourage you to seek them out. And I'm saying that not only as a member, but as a board member of, of LPC. Um, attending, I attended the meeting, the forum in 2018 in Minneapolis, and there was a representative of Coco Foundation there doing a beta test of a new open source software called Editoria, which directly addressed those two latter needs that we have of kind of managing the editing process of, of a work as well as the exporting into a custom template. So we started doing a beta test with Editoria, still using OMP, but like, okay, how can we make these two systems work together for cost savings, for qual you know, man managing quality, and so forth. So like I said, the workflows that we discovered um, as we kind of went through OMP, I kind of already said some of this, I got ahead of myself. But some of the workflow that needs that we had, um, or workflows that we workflow that we have, is like I said, prospective author, authors are submitting their proposals through OMP, and we're kind of doing a first round of peer review in OMP on that proposal. Um, what we discovered, though, was that once we did that, um, once a proposal was taken in as a submission, that closed off the ability for an author then to come back and submit a manuscript through OMP. And so we had to develop a workaround using the discussion area for them to upload a manuscript. So I had, when I was at the PKP Sprint in Pittsburgh, um, 
earlier this summer, opened up a conversation with the developers about maybe doing some customization work to add an additional, an additional um, additional submission stage so that once the proposal is submitted and accepted that the author can still go back in and upload the manuscript. So we're still kind of trying to work that, work that out if it is feasible and at a cost that we can afford to pay that kind of cost of development because there was some other talk in the room at that time at the sprint that, oh yeah, that would be a great feature to be able to do kind of proposals as well. And I guess they've heard that from others um, to be able to submit a proposal in advance of a full manuscript. Um, I also talked about workflow and about um, you know, use, utilizing or relying upon track changes in Word and the submission of multiple th files through OMP and kind of managing the versions and the way that some of the, you know, the PKP sites, the way they name the files, and this was something else we talked about at the Sprint in Pittsburgh, was trying to make sense of the file naming system because it's called one thing in the system and when you download it, it's called something else and trying to keep track of and match all those things up can sometimes be, a, can be challenging. And then again, workflow, we're contracting with external proofreaders and designers to copy edit the text, typically utilizing either, either marked up PDFs or Word documents to then produce something in Adobe InDesign that is a professional looking um, book. And so trying to think of ways that we can streamline that, save money on that process as well. Um, so kind of solutions and next steps, as I said, I attended the PKP, that's a spring, it should say sprint, um, it's Pittsburgh, and really had great discussions with, um, with Dulip, who's here in the room, who utilizes OMP quite a bit, as well as with PKP staff, about how to make OMP work more for us in our, in our workflow, and on integrating this functionality of being able to have proposal submission and then manuscript subscription within the system. Because um, we definitely prefer OMP. Um, my staff member did like this big, before, before John, um, oh, what's his name? John at Simon Fraser, you know, he did this big landscape analysis of all the open source kind of softwares out there. And my staff member kind of did a, did a investigation on his own of just the book piece of it. And there's really no one out there that's doing what OMP does. And we will probably always use it because of that, because of that back end, because of the communication. And, and the things that it offers. There's no one else out there doing it. Um, so, uh, you know, we don't want to move away from that. As far as manus manuscript preparation and review, as I said, we have really fully adopted Editoria, um, and I highly suggest you check it out. It's a really exciting piece of software. Um, to kind of, it's kind of a web-based, think of, think of kind of like Google Doc. You upload your full manuscript in there. It, it automatically breaks it down into individual chapters. And it, and it has that same kind of an editor or a peer reviewer or a proofreader can go in and mark up the text or leave inline comments. And there's like a timeline and you can move the manuscript to and you can move individual chapters to different stages in production just by dragging it along the slider. And when you move it to one stage or another, it opens up different sets of permissions depending on what role a user has. So when the proofreader has it, it's the author can't get in there and mess with it, an editor can't get in there and mess with it. They make their changes and then they move it to like the review stage where the author can go in and review the proposed changes and accept or um, or decline those proposed changes or respond to inline comments. And so you kind of, for this kind of review part, um, where you're just kind of marking up, making, do, doing your copy editing, you kind of just move the document along and you, everything's in real time. You see all those changes there. It's all being saved. Like I said, it's like a Google Doc, but it's much, it's much fancier. Um, they're working on integration of tables. Um, you can put, drop your images in there with, with your captions. Um, you can produce you know, all of your endnotes. It's really a slick piece of software for kind of that copy editing layout piece piece of it that um, and we've just and we did just publish a book out of Editoria a couple weeks ago um, so editoria.pub for that and then as I said copy editing the kind of the actual layout um, Editoria allows you to create a custom template in your you know your style that matches your press's brand and then it's one button you push one button and it exports it into your template in PDF or EPUB. You don't have to have any fancy graphics software or anything. Once your template is in there, it's all, it's all done by JavaScript and CSS. Um, and so once your template is built is in, and it's in there, anytime you want it ready to publish a book, it's one button. 
you click it and you get a PDF and an EPUB of your book. It's really super slick. And we were really, really happy with the results with the book that we just did. Um, and there's some integration where if perhaps you want to change things up, it's called Paged JS. Um, and if you want to change the way maybe this book looks as opposed to any other, like, okay, well, for this book, we want to change all the heading styles or colors. You can actually have side by side the book and the CSS, and you can go in and make changes and see it real time, and then you can export just that book if you want to make that kind of on the fly change to your template. So really super slick. And like I said, we just published a book out of Editoria. So we used OMP for like the first piece of it, did all of the copy editing and layout in Editoria, and then just published a book. So we really utilized both systems to produce a book. Um, as I said, community participation is definitely important in both of these communities, in both OMP and Editoria. So like I said, my staff member um, has been working with some of the PKP staff to contribute to the um, updated documentation for OMP. Um, and of course, opportunities like this. Although I find, as, as, as Israel said, I'm the only person here <laughs> that's, that's doing OMP. And I would really like to see that community grow. I don't know if it is just a reflection of open book publishing, open monograph publishing, just most a lot of folks aren't doing it. Um, but it's a really great piece of software to, to help support that. Um, we've been working on some really interesting, uh, my new staff member came up with this really cool template for documentation for using OMP and OJS, which as soon as it's done, we intend to contribute back to the community for others to kind of use as a template for starting their own kind of document internal documentation, something that you can kind of customize and use to use like with your own editorial boards or your own proofreaders or whoever it may be that you need to provide documentation for. We intend to kind of dedicate that back to the community for use. Same with Editoria. Um, we went through a lot of steps with them to kind of develop this customized template and we committed that back to the community to reuse as well. And then it can change the colors or things, but kind of the way a book is laid out. So we're really about utilizing these things and producing reusable resources that folks that are using this open source software, because that's really what it's about. It's about supporting the community, not just gobbling things up to use for yourself. And so we're trying to stay true to that. And again, you know, part of that community participation is attending events like this. Um, I'm going to the Editoria community meeting the first week of December in Chicago. Participating in sprints, I can't tell you how invaluable that was, especially for conversations for me around OMP. That hour or two that I spent with Dulip and talking to Nate um, when I was at the PKP Sprint in Pittsburgh was so useful. So if a sprint is anywhere in your area, I can't, I can't stress enough how important it is to participate in those, um, to contribute to feature development and give feedback and just work one-on-one -on -one with other users.